On the front of the bulletin is a is a version of the 23rd Psalm. I'd like you to take it out and, uh, and look at it with me. In fact, uh, let's uh, let's say it together. Shall we? Uh, uh, please read along with me. The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my heart will fill Sure, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. When you were a child, my parents took my sister Susie and I to Niagara Falls on vacation. Among the things we did during that visit was go to an old, dilapidated uh, museum they had there back in the 50s and 60s. I don't think it's there now. In this museum, there was a mummy, an Egyptian mummy. I remember marveling at this curiosity and at the coffin in which he rested. The coffin is called a sarcophagus. On the lid of the sarcophagus that was standing up next to the mummy was a stylized image of the occupant, what he looked like in life, and it showed something of his status. I remember that. I also remember when I was 36 years old, I stood before another sarcophagus. A sarcophagus lid that was exquisite. This time I was in Cairo, Egypt, at the Egyptian Museum there. And there before me, in the glass case, a golden sarcophagus. I could not touch it, but I was remarkably close to it, and I could see every detail. It was the inner sarcophagus of King Tut, the boy pharaoh of Egypt, whose tomb was discovered mostly intact by Howard Carter on November 24, 1922. Before me, as I stood there, was an exquisite representation of Tut, the full of royal regalia. The lid was made of solid gold, and precious stones of various colors adorned his headdress and other parts of his face. Especially the rich lapis lazuli added beauty, such beauty. It was difficult to restrain. I thrill something so beautiful, so old. I noticed that on the sarcophagus lid, Tut's arms were crossed. In his right hand was a whip. And that whip was a symbol of his authority. In his left hand was a, a shepherd's staff, and it symbolized, of course, his role as the leader of his people uh, with a responsibility to take care of and to um, uh, look out for their interests. I stood there wondering over this ancient symbol, especially the shepherd's crook. I could not help think to myself, Lord, no. Beloved among the Psalms, we find in the Bible just one, the 23rd. It was not always popular, you know. Um, it was uh, really came to popularity in America during the Civil War. Um, Henry Ward Beecher in New York City, the popular preacher. He preached a number of sermons about the 23rd Psalm and got national attention to a printed newspapers all across the land about, about the 23rd Psalm and uh, what a resource it was uh, for, for people. The Psalm boasts and authored, and it says in the Bible that none other than King David himself wrote this poem. The same King David who ruled over Israel some 3,000 years ago. And those of you who are familiar with this story know that he started up as a shepherd. Watching over 
his father's flock of sheep. And we are told that he grew up with the child. And he could kill a predator with a slingshot, that he could he could ward off predators. And he was good at finding strays and good at keeping the flock together. During those long hours of shepherding, he would lead his sheep to water. He'd take them to grassy hills for food and rest. And most of all, keep them together. But he shepherds, he also has time to reflect. So there's after the water and after the food, there's a the rest time, nap time for the sheep, and he watch over them. And so he thought of this beautiful metaphor. It came to his mind, the Lord is my shepherd. Like the sheep in his care, David realized he too needed someone to watch over him. Just like a shepherd leads sheep to food, water, and safety. God cares for us. We are compelled to rejoice with David, as he says. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Sometimes I need to restore the soul. How about you? How about you? Lots of people today feel broken inside. We're weary from the responsibilities of life. or troubled because they carry around with them a sense of hopelessness or meaninglessness. Many are trapped in circumstances that they can't do anything about. Some try to seek remedy or a broken heart and alcohol or illegal drugs, but they're, they're ineffective. They don't really help. Some lose their minds and distract them like Facebook. I know a lady who went into Facebook and she hasn't come out yet. <laughs> TV's going all the time. Radio, noise. We try to fill up the emptiness with busy work. And inside there's a, there's a deep sorrow. There's a deep grief. There's a deep pain. David offers us an alternative. He reminds us that no matter what our peers and acquaintances say, no matter the single wisdom of the culture, there is really a peace that passes all understanding. And God has the ability to restore our hearts to the health. David reminds us to put our trust in God. Only we must turn to God. God is not for us. It's not upon us. We must turn to God. We must have faith. We must put our trust in God. He restores my soul whenever I am tempted to cynicism, sarcasm, and disdain. Ah, the real enemies of our era. He restores my soul when I am he restores my soul when I'm heart sick about the attitudes and behaviors of others. He restores my soul by renewing the right spirit within me. Like sheep. Mary, you need to turn that back. This is God's feedback. I put it back. Turn it toward me. Like sheep, we must hear and respond to the call of the shepherd. He, do, he can do nothing for us unless we go to him in prayer with the expectation of loving care. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Righteousness is a fancy word that means right living. It means living with God as your guide and things ethical and moral. It means following the example of Jesus and showing compassion and willingness to help. This is about sticking together. This is about maintaining a common purpose. If all the sheep go their own way, you see the shepherd can do little. The following the shepherd and staying together will get us safely through and on our own. We follow the shepherd in right living by keeping the Ten Commandments. That's not enough. We are also expected to go beyond the Ten Commandments. Jesus said, You for it said, Thou shalt not murder, but I stand and you don't even hate. You see right after. Are not enough. We must also have right attitudes. We choose our attitudes. We also choose our attitudes. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, this is better translated than deep darkness. Who among us of 
not experienced uh, a deep darkness, a time of darkness in our lives. It's sometimes difficult to see the way forward. Uncertainty and familiar circumstances breed fear within. And yet, in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, whatever that deep darkness comes into our lives, we can, we can be assured that, that, that thou art with me. Sheep lack good eyes. They can't see her. In the same way that we lack the force of I hear the call of God to walk boldly into the future. Just as a sheep hear the call of the shepherd in the wings and light of the day. Staying together is the key. If you get too bold, too self-sufficient, too cocky, you may wander away from the safety and into the mouth of the lion. It is a fair warning given by Peter that the devil is a lion wandering around seeking whom he may devour. When David said to talk about with me, he came to his tents. He stopped talking about God and started talking to God. And each of us must do this on our own. And as a church, we must do this too. Not to talk so much about God as to talk to God in prayer. David stopped talking about God, starts talking to God. And we must move from observation, talking about God, to relationship, talking to God. Thou is a word that indicates relationship. I and thou, they go together. It is a saving relationship because the deep trust of the relationship will lead us to safety and to service. Not only does the individual sheep belong with the flock, but the individual sheep must join the other sheep. And being of service, you see the sheep give their wool to keep up his farm and protect them from the elements. Christian service is the lifeblood of the church. Show me a church that does not reach out with the love of Christ to those in need, and I will show you a church that's distorted or even dead. We are the flock, you see, and we must listen to the shepherd and take our cues from the shepherd, not just for our own personal sake, but so we may ultimately be of service to others. Jesus said, I am the church. There is the main plan. The power of Christ is represented in the rod and the staff of the shepherd. Fierce into the powers and principalities of evil and comfort to the sheep. We must turn to the power of Christ when we need comfort. His forgiveness and mercy give us hope for the future and purpose for our lives. We are served by God at the banquet of worship and communion, safe from all evil. So that we go out from a place like this full of blessings over short, overflowing to share with others. To love and to serve God is to love and to serve our neighbors, you see. Look back. Look back on your life. Go ahead. Look back on your life. It was difficult to be long ago away, wasn't there? Of course, you had hard times. But if you take an honest look, you will also see that God has been with you the whole time. Goodness and mercy, you see, have followed you around like a couple of little puppy dogs, blessing you with joy the whole way. Can you look back and see the puppy dogs? Can you see them? Mercy. One name, goodness. And they've been with you the whole time. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, reminds us of a house maintained in heaven by our heavenly Father. Jesus tells us he is going to prepare a room for us in that heavenly house. Amen. Master carpenter, customizing a room just for you. When you live in a house and you have your own room, it means you belong. It means you belong. You belong to the family. You belong to the family of God, not just now. But in eternity. It is a promise of God secured by your faith and your faithfulness. Psalm 23, you see, you cannot be exhausted. The spiritual treasure of this favorite psalm cannot be exhausted. Dwell on it, meditate on it. Inspired by God, it was David's gift to you. We will teach it to the children of vacation Bible school. Some of them will memorize it. And it's right that we do this. If we give it to them when they're young, you see, they'll carry it around with them their whole life. Say it again. The Lord is 